What's going on guys, my name is Matt and I am back with a new PC build. This time the price point is $500 and for that price you're getting a very capable gaming PC. In this video I'm going to be showing you all the parts, explain why I picked them, show you how to put everything together step by step, and finally show you how it performs in today's most popular titles. This PC is super simple to put together and is perfect for first time builders. But before I get further into the build, I want to take a minute to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Opera GX. Opera GX is a browser designed specifically with PC gamers and enthusiasts in mind. GX offers CPU slash RAM limiters for improved game performance along with Twitch slash Discord integration. But one of my favorite things about it is how customizable it is. GX is free and takes seconds to download slash install, and once in you can press this little tab up here to open all the customization settings. There are different preset themes that you can adjust to your heart's desires, along with easy toggles for dark mode and tons of other options to make the experience perfect for you. One of my favorite things to enable is this Force Dark Pages option that basically turns dark mode on all the pages you visit. Importing bookmarks also takes seconds to do, making the process of switching to GX super simple. What's even cooler is GX is also available on mobile and is a great companion to the desktop version. If you're tired of your browser taking up a ton of system resources and hurting performance, then I would highly recommend checking out the ultra customizable browser that is Opera GX. Make sure to check out the link in the description to download and start using GX today. It's a product I really like and have been using for a while now, and downloading GX is a 100% free way to support the channel. Thanks again to Opera GX for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to your regularly scheduled content. So like I was saying before, this is a $500 gaming PC that's very simple to assemble and is capable of playing pretty much anything you throw at it at 1080p 60 plus FPS. This system is using new parts, one of which will definitely be a controversial pick, but I'll give alternatives when we get to that one. Now before I get into this step by step guide on putting this together and into the benchmarks, I want to first talk about each of the parts going into this PC and why I picked them. So without further ado, let's dive right in. So the first thing I usually like to pick when parting out a system is the CPU as other than the GPU, this has the biggest impact on gaming performance and determines a number of other factors with the build. With a total budget of $500, we can't get anything crazy, but at around $100, the i3-12100F that I picked is offering great value and performance. This is a 4-core, 8-thread CPU running on the Intel 7 lithography, clock speeds are pretty decent with it able to turbo up to 4.3 GHz, and the fact it's a 12th gen Intel processor means IPC is great as well. 4 cores and 8 threads is perfect for a budget gaming PC and is even enough for a lot of basic workstation applications. One other nice thing about this CPU is it comes with a decent stock cooler in the box. This is Intel's updated stock cooler, it has a sleek design and copper slug for increased cooling performance. It's not really anything special, but it keeps our little i3 cool and quiet while also allowing us to save some money as it comes free in the box. Aftermarket coolers are nice and all, but at this type of budget, going with a stock cooler is a no-brainer. The next part I want to talk about is the motherboard. After looking at a few different options, I ended up settling on the MSI Pro B660M-G, which is in the micro-ATX format. This board comes in at $99, and for that price, we're getting some pretty good value. It has multiple M.2 slots, decent PCIe expansion, pretty good back panel I.O., and a neutral color scheme that matches this build well. One big downside of this board is the fact it only has two DIMM slots, meaning upgrading memory in the future will require switching out your current kit. This isn't the end of the world, but is definitely worth pointing out. With that being said, one nice thing about the DIMM slots on this board is the fact they use inexpensive DDR4 memory, which still performs well and costs considerably less than DDR5. Overall, I think this board fits well into the build and has worked great thus far. Speaking of memory, let's talk about what RAM I picked. I decided to go for a 2x8GB kit of this Team Group T-Force Vulcan Z memory. This is DDR4 RAM running at 3200MHz CL16, which is a very good sweet spot for price to performance RAM in a budget build. It's a black kit so it matches the rest of the parts and I've used this same kit many times in the past with no problems. 16GB is plenty of memory for a budget gaming PC like this one, but you could always opt to spend 30 bucks more on a 32GB kit which I'll also have linked in the description below. Moving on to storage, I went for another pretty basic choice in the form of this 512GB silicon power SSD. This is an NVMe SSD in the ultra compact M.2 form factor, meaning it takes seconds to install. 
Performance isn't amazing, but at only $28, you're getting a decent chunk of NVMe storage for your new budget rig. 512 gigabytes is more than enough for your OS, applications, and a modest sized games library. With that being said, if you do run out of space, you can always just pop another NVMe drive into the extra slot on the motherboard, or even go for a mechanical drive for a lot of storage on the cheap. Moving on to the graphics card, this is the part I was referring to earlier which is definitely going to be controversial. To stay within budget and have a new card, I basically only had one option which is the infamous AMD RX 6500 XT. At $150, this card has solid 1080p gaming performance and an adequate 4GB of video memory. I won't go into all the reasons why people don't like this card, but the main things are the fact it only uses 4 PCIe lanes and the lack of a video encoder. For about $70 more, you can get an RX 6600 which is a much better card with a video encoder, but again, to fit into the budget, the 6500 XT was really the only option. The version I have here is the Power Color Fighter model which features a very basic dual fan design with no backplate and only two video outputs. But again, if you're just gaming, this card should work very well and is great in combination with our i3-12100F. To power this system, I went with the tried and trusted EVGA 450BR. I got this for under $40 at the time of purchase, but since then prices of power supplies have jumped up significantly. The EVGA 450BR, like the name implies, is a 450 watt, 80 plus bronze rated unit. 450 watts may not seem like a lot, but under a full load this PC maxes out at well under 300 watts. It's a non-modular unit, but it has all black sleeve cables, and all the excess are easily hidden away in the power supply basement of our case. Speaking of the case, I went for one of the best budget enclosures of all time. This is the Thermaltake Versa H18. It doesn't have any flashy RGB, but at under $50, it has a ton of features. These include a tempered glass side panel, a power supply basement, full mesh front panel, and plenty of dust filters. There is only one included fan as exhaust, but for a budget system like this one, it works out fine. Other than its sleek looks and slew of features, my favorite thing about this case is how easy it is to build in. A lot of times, micro ATX cases are cramped, but this one is a dream to work with. In the end, the Versa H18 worked out great in this build. All in all, for $500, you're getting a set of parts that make up a very solid budget gaming PC. I will be showing you how it performs in games, but first, I'm going to show you how to put it together step by step. Again, this is a very simple PC to build, and I'll be guiding you through the whole process. To build this PC, the only tools you're going to need are a standard Phillips head screwdriver and a smaller Phillips head screwdriver for the M.2 screw. You're also going to want to have a big open area to work on and block out an afternoon to assemble and set up your PC. So with your parts in hand, workstation clear, and schedule open, it's now time to start assembling your new system. The first thing to get out is your motherboard. Open up the box, pull out the board itself, then under the cardboard pull out the I.O. shield. Now you can take the board out of the bag and put it on top of the box. Grab out your CPU and bring your attention to the center of the motherboard. Push down and out on this metal lever, it'll pop up and just make sure it's fully hinged back. Now lift open the other part of the socket like this to expose the pins. Now take your CPU and line it up in the socket. You can either line the cutouts in the CPU with the cutouts in the socket, or there is a little triangle on the CPU and on the motherboard that you can line up too. Either way, once lined up, lower it down, applying no pressure, it should just slot in. Once in, you can hinge back over this side of the socket, press it down lightly, the cover will pop away, then hinge the socket arm back down and under the hook like this. Now it's time to install the cooler. It comes with thermal paste pre-applied so there's no need to add our own. Take the cooler with the cable facing the top of the board and lower it down, lining up the pegs in the cooler with the holes in the motherboard. Once they're lined up and the cooler is lowered down, press each peg into place in a cross pattern. They should all clip in and the cooler should be secure enough that you can handle the board by it like this. Once that's done, grab the CPU fan cable and locate the CPU fan header right here. Bring the cable to the header and line up the notch in the connector with the bump out on the header and once lined up, simply press it in a place like this. Finally, to clean the looks up, you can try and bunch up slash tuck away the CPU cable like this. Once that's done, it means your CPU and cooler are successfully installed, and we can now move on to the RAM. We have two sticks and two slots, so it's pretty simple. Start by opening up the clips on both of these slots, then you can grab your first stick of RAM and line the notch in the stick with the notch in the slot and lower it into place. Once your shirt's lined up correctly, press down on both sides until the clip snaps shut and the stick is secure in place. 
Next, just repeat this process for the second stick of RAM and you'll have successfully installed your memory. Now bring your attention to the M.2 slot directly below the CPU cooler. Take your smaller screwdriver, loosen or remove the two screws then lift away the heatsink, also making sure to peel away this plastic. Bring your M.2 drive to the slot and line the notch in it with the notch in the slot. You can now insert it at an angle like this. Once in, you can hinge down the SSD and carefully set down the heatsink on top of it. Then just reinstall the two screws we removed earlier. With that done, we are now ready to put the motherboard aside and pull out our case. One tip is to pull the box away from the case like this instead of trying to pull the case out of the box. Once out, you can unscrew the top and bottom thumb screws on the back panel, pull back on it and lift it away. Then you can untie and remove this bag here which contains all the screws necessary for building your PC. Now tip it onto its side like this, unscrew the four thumb screws and lift the panel away. I like to keep these panels in the box and protected by foam while I build as this gets them out of the way and keeps them safe. With that done, take your IO shield and orient it like this, then lower it down to the IO cutout and press in each corner one at a time until they snap in and the IO shield is secure. This can be a little annoying to do, but just keep at it until it's fully in place. Now take your motherboard, handling it by the cooler, and lower it in at an angle like this, then hinge it down lining up the IO with the IO shield and making sure you can see the standoffs beneath the motherboard holes. Now from your screw bag, grab out six motherboard screws that look like this and install one into each of the motherboard holes with a standoff beneath it. Order doesn't matter, just make sure they're all secure. Now you can lift the case back onto its feet and get out your power supply. Take it with the fan facing down and insert it into the back of the case like this, making sure the holes in the power supply line up with the holes in the case. Now take four power supply screws that look like this and install one into each of the holes securing the power supply into place. With that done, we can now start routing cables. Start by taking the 8-pin CPU cable that looks like this and push it through the hole in the top right here. Now take the big 24-pin connector that looks like this, along with the blue USB 3 cable that looks like this, and push them through this hole here. Next, take the USB 2 and HD audio block connectors that look like this and push them through this hole here, which enters into the main chamber right here. Now, take the little front panel connectors that look like this and the PCIe power cable that looks like this and push them through this hole here, which enters into the main chamber right here. Finally, take the Molex case connector and a Molex cable from your power supply and plug them together like this. With that done, we can set the case onto its side and start plugging things in. At the top left of the case, grab the 8-pin CPU connector and make sure both pieces are pressed together. Then line up the notch on the header with the clip on the connector and press it into place making sure the clip snaps secure over the bump out. Now take your attention to the right side of the board, grab the 24-pin making sure the two pieces are pressed together, then line the bump out and clip up and press it into place. Now directly below that, grab the USB 3 cable and line up the bump out on the connector with the indent on the header and press it into place. Now we'll plug in all of the front panel I.O. starting at the bottom left of the board. Grab the HD audio cable and locate the HD audio header. Now with the HD audio text facing the top of the board, press the connector into place like this. Now to the right of this, take the USB block connector with the text facing down and press it into one of the two USB 2 headers right here. Once that's in, bring your attention to the tiny front panel connectors and the JFP1 header at the bottom right of the board. Start with the power switch and plug it into these two pins right here. Orientation doesn't matter. Then plug in the reset switch directly below that. Again, orientation doesn't matter. Finally, take the HDD LED connector and press it into these two pins, making sure the positive is to the left. The last little cable to install is the back fan cable which installs into the header to the left of the M.2 slot and goes in the same way the CPU fan cable did. Then with that done, we are now going to install the final component, the graphics card. Start by removing the top two screws on the back PCIe covers like this, then loosen up, pull up, and re-secure this little panel. You can now remove the two top covers that look like this. Now unlock this PCIe lock on the top slot and grab out your card. Line the cutout in the card with the notch in the slot, line it up, lower it down, and press it into place. You can now re-secure that sliding panel and reinstall those two PCIe cover screws. Now you can take your PCIe power connector, line it up with the header on the card, and press it into place. 
With that done, you can put the PC back onto its feet and we can do the last thing before reinstalling the panels, which is cable manage the system. I start by pulling all the excess cable link to the back of the case. I push all the loose cables under the power supply basement, then neaten up the cable runs and in this case didn't even tie anything down. I just made sure everything was flat, made sure the main chamber looked good, then reinstalled the back panel. For the glass panel, I set it on upside down, removed the back plastic, flipped it into place, removed the top plastic, then reinstalled the thumb screws. With that done, we're now ready to turn the PC on for the first time, but there are still a number of things to do before you can start downloading and enjoying games. The first is to install Windows, which I'm not going to show in this video, but I'll link tutorials on how to do that in the description. Then you can download and install the drivers, which will also be linked in the description. Once your PC is up and running, you'll need to go into the BIOS by turning the PC off, then when you turn it back on, immediately start smashing the delete key. Once in BIOS, you can go to the memory tab, make sure the XMP profile is enabled and press F10 to save and exit. With that done, you're now ready to start downloading and enjoying some games. Speaking of games, I think it's now time to show you some benchmarks. I tried to test a bunch of popular and hard to run games, but make sure to leave your suggestions for other games I should test in future builds and videos. So without further ado, here are the gaming benchmarks. As you can see, this PC performs really well in esports and AAA gaming at 1080p. Overall, this is a very solid, all new build that would be a great start for someone wanting to get into PC gaming. I hope this video was helpful or at least entertaining as these build guides are a lot of work, but if you guys keep watching them, then I'll keep making them. Let me know what you guys think of this build in the comments below. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up, give it a thumbs up if you liked it and consider subscribing. Oh, and as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.